Hi everybody, welcome to the webinar. Um, this is Matt Craven here. This is me in the middle of the page there. Um, we're gonna be on this session for about 45 to 60 minutes. Uh, this is all about advanced CV writing. So I'm gonna show you how to get more interviews for better jobs at a higher salary. So it's all about creating a CV that's fit for purpose for the current marketplace um, that's innovative, that's high impact, that's going to get you much better results than your typical homemade CV. So without further ado, let's go through this uh, presentation. <clears throat> so I'm going to just start very quickly by telling you who we are. Um, I guess if you're going to listen to my dulcet tones for the next best part of an hour, it might be useful to know who I am, who we are, and how we become to be qualified to talk to you about these things. Okay, so um, uh, I am the founder of the CV and Interview Advisors, um, as well as another business called LinkedIn Credible, which specializes in LinkedIn. Um, so um, I guess you could say I'm a bit of an entrepreneur, uh, built this business up from scratch, um, fairly sizable business uh, in terms of what we do. Um, I <coughs> was senior management within the recruitment industry. Uh, I did that for about six years. I uh, did everything from junior contract recruitment through to senior exec headhunting. I uh, did quite a lot of um, <coughs> uh, talking and presentations to international audiences. Um, I'm not a trained presenter, so I'm fairly, fairly kind of low key and uh, down to earth with my presentations. Um, but I do tend to do quite a lot of it now. Um, <coughs> and um, my trade, I suppose, is personal branding and career development, and that's what I've done. Um, if you include my stint in recruitment, you know, best part of my career uh, has been in that kind of industry, although I did spend the early part of my career uh, within the um, uh, vehicle automotive sector, uh, again, at sort of senior management level. Um, so that's a little bit about me. That's the boring bit done. Uh, as a company, <coughs> um, I think I can safely say we're considered to be the UK's highest quality provider of uh, CV writing services but not just CV writing we do the whole spectrum of career services from career coaching CV writing LinkedIn profiles all that kind of good stuff interview coaching as well um, so our team over here <coughs> typically people who've been senior industry professionals or they are sort of executive uh, career leadership coaches um, people who worked in recruitment uh, we've got people who um, <coughs> have authored books um, spoke to <coughs> one of my old team recently actually who uh, left us to go and lecture at Harvard um, so uh, on emotional intelligence actually as a subject matter um, <coughs> so we've got some really experienced people over here um, and we partner with uh, over 20 professional bodies so I'm talking chartered and non-chartered institutes and associations that represent professionals in the IT, finance, um, engineering, uh, all, all sorts of industries. Um, you know, we, we work with people from the HR uh, sector, marketing, you know. Really, if you look at the entire range of professions throughout the UK, uh, we service all those professions and we've got relationships with uh, most of the uh, uh, professional bodies. Um, um, of note. Um, so that's a little bit about us. Um, my virtual colleague here, <coughs> um, she's going to drop in some little nuggets as we go through this session. And uh, I, I quite like this one. Um, and it's just really relevant to this slide because we're talking about us and what we do. Um, but, you know, it's not illiterate people that use our service or people who don't know how to write a CV. Our clients are typically savvy, experienced, usually quite senior professionals uh, and, and executives um, as well, um, <clears throat> who just understand that outsourcing this very important uh, task in, in terms of creating their CV gives them a significant leg up in the marketplace. So yeah, just sowing that seed really. Um, <clears throat> so now don't run away just yet because I always laugh when I see this what is a CV because most people who 
who are watching this are going to be going, I know what a CV is. Of course I know what a CV is. This is for junior people who don't even know what a CV is. Um, that's not what I'm driving at here. Um, what I'm driving at here is that people seem to be in the mindset that a CV is just a list, a list of where you've worked with a list of bullet points underneath that explaining what you did in that role, a list of qualifications, a list of personal details, just a list. And that's fine, that stuff needs to be in your CV. But if that's all your CV is, <coughs> it's gonna be nowhere as good as what it could be. Um, think about this, quite a lot of employers ask people to fill out application forms. Why is that? Well, I know why that is. It's because as a general rule, CVs don't give them the information they're looking for. Um, <clears throat> how many of you are using the same format that you did when you left education? <clears throat> Quite common that people will be 20, 25 years into their career and they'll still be using the same old CV format they did when they left school, college or university. Now you'd have thought that perhaps things have moved on a little bit in the last 20, 25 years, wouldn't you? Well, they have. Um, <clears throat> so we, we say a CV should be a business case, uh, a business case that explains why someone should hire you. So think about your salary, what you're going to cost your future employer. Think about how your CV can demonstrate that you can deliver return on investment, because it is a sizable investment. You know, if you take a I was talking to a group of 50k candidates recently we made them work out what they would cost their next employer assuming they would stick around for maybe three years which is a decent enough stint and they're all quite shocked to realize that they were going to cost their future employer probably something in and around a quarter of a million quid quite a lot of money that's the investment that that company is making in them so when we started thinking about cobbling together a homemade CV <clears throat> over a couple of uh, shandies on a Sunday afternoon and um, doing a couple of hours of interview preparation, all of a sudden that just didn't seem commensurate with pitching for a quarter of a million pound three year employment contract, which is what getting a job is, isn't it, right? So a bad CV is a list, a good CV is a business case. We also need CVs now to be optimized for uh, recruitment software. So keywords are important for searches, but we're going to cover that in quite a lot more detail on one of the following slides. Think about this as well. <clears throat> um, and LinkedIn plays an important role now. We'll cover that off at the end. But, you know, as a general rule, in 92% of cases, somebody's going to want to read your CV before they invite you in for an interview. So as much as we would like CVs to be, you know, nothing special, <laughs> it really is the most important document you will ever own, assuming your career is important to you. Because, ne you know, hardly ever has a job been offered to somebody uh, when, when the CV hasn't been a fairly fundamental and important part of that process. So it's crucial, you know, it really is crucial. And most people completely and utterly underestimate how important their CV is. <clears throat> um, so, next slide. Let's have a look at the... Um, so we're kind of going to go through um, the, the CV section by section, okay? So the first section that you would expect to see on a CV is what we call the professional summary. Some people call it a personal profile. Um, but what this is, is this paragraph <coughs> that sits under your name. So of course you're going to have your name at the top, but then you're going to have a paragraph. And that paragraph is going to introduce you, what you can do, how you can do it, um, to the person reading it. So you can call it a professional summary. You could call it a personal profile, although I don't like personal profile because I think what it does is it encourages you to talk about your personality which we don't want you to do. You could call it a profile slash summary if you really wanted to, um, or if you're very senior, you could call it an executive summary. <clears throat> Whatever you pick, make sure it's an obvious heading because um, the recruitment software, the applicant tracking systems, need to recognize what that section is. 
we actually call it a profile slash summary, hedging our bets a little bit. But this is the paragraph that sits right at the top of the CV. Okay. So the first thing we want to tell people is what you are. <clears throat> and I have something I call the cheap red shoes theory. And it, it goes a bit like this. So let's just imagine you all wake up tomorrow morning with a burning desire to buy a pair of cheap red shoes. So what are you going to do? You're probably going to go onto the internet and you're going to type into your search engine. Maybe it's Google or Safari or whatever it might be. And you're going to type in buy cheap red shoes. Because that's what you want to do, right? You want to buy some cheap red shoes. Now, if a little advert pops up and says, we sell cheap red shoes. Well, great. You're probably going to have a little look at that uh, um, advert because it's 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 kind of said what you had in your mind. You want to buy cheap red shoes, they're selling cheap red shoes. But then maybe there's another advert that pops up that says, we sell shoes of all shapes and sizes. Now that's a company that's really hedging its bets, right? But the problem is no one's going to click on that if they're looking for cheap red shoes because who's to say that these shoes of all shapes and sizes includes cheap red shoes? Maybe they just have one set of cheap red shoes. They certainly don't specialise in cheap red shoes, or at least they've not said they do. So the point I'm making here is, if you're specific and you tell somebody that you're selling what they want to buy, <coughs> then they will interact with you. They'll engage with you. If you're woolly and ambiguous, they won't. So how does this play out on a CV? Well, let me give you an example. I saw a CV um, recently that said, I'm an experienced IT professional. Now I looked at that, this is the first line of the CV, I looked at that and I thought, that could literally be one of maybe about 200 different types of job. Maybe 200's an exaggeration, but certainly one of many types of, you know, does that mean you're a business analyst, a technical architect, a developer, you know, an IT director, a CTO, an IT first line support person? I, no idea, it didn't tell me. No one in the history of recruitment has been looking for an IT professional. They would have been looking for one of those job titles that I've just mentioned. So you've got to tell people that you are something specific. Now if that means you having multiple CVs because you've got multiple strings to your bow, then so be it. But you must be specific. <coughs> now that's the easy bit. A little bit more tricky is to create a value proposition statement. So what is the purpose of you professionally? So if I was pitching myself to somebody as a CV writer, um, which I don't do very much of anymore from a hands-on perspective, my team do that, but if I was, I'd be telling you that my value proposition is that I'm an expert in developing leading edge personal branding documentation such as CVs and LinkedIn profiles that significantly improves my client's ability to get a job or a contract role. That's the purpose of me as far as my target audience will be concerned. What's your value proposition statement? And then we go on to talking about key strengths. So very simply, what are the four things that you're really good at that you'd like to crow about in this first paragraph on your CV? And we write these in a features and benefits style. <coughs> which I'll highlight in a minute, but don't just say, well, I have this skill. Say, well, I have this skill, and this is how it will benefit your organisation. And those skills need to align with the skills that employers and companies are looking for, right? So here's an example. This is a finance director. So, we've, so th what are they? They're a finance director. What is their value proposition? Well, it's all about um, embedding financial governance across organizations to protect cash flow and profit. What are their key strengths? Well, they're really good at assembling and managing teams, um, doing um, uh, sort of <coughs> appraisal and, and feasibility and analysis work for various scenarios. <coughs> they're very good at embedding financial ownership across management teams to drive superior bottom line performance. So there's the benefit to the feature and leading major cost rationalization programs to remove costs and uplift profitability. You know, in these uncertain economic times, 
leading cost rationalisation programmes on a fairly regular basis is is what companies do. It's what big companies do. In fact, we've done it. You know, we regularly look at our P and L and think, well, what are we spending money on that we don't really need to? And then you, you invest in things over time, and then six months later, again, you've got things you've you've bought but aren't using, or people you've hired that aren't fully utilised. You've got to constantly do this. But don't just say you're good at it. Talk about how it benefits the organisation. Now, <clears throat> I've deliberately you know, put two benefits on there rather than four because I want to highlight now how much more powerful it is when you really, really go to town on that. So here's another example. <coughs> so there again, we did the same thing. We talked about what that person is what their um, value proposition is and then we went on to talk about their four key strengths but there we've talked more about the benefits of the features or the benefits of the skills so that stuff in red really highlights how that person's skills talents and abilities will benefit the organizations that they work for so I'll just give you a couple of uh, couple of seconds to read through that. <coughs> okay, let's move on. So a quick word of caution. Don't use random skills or things that you think you're good at but don't have any relevance to what your future employers or if you're a contractor clients are looking for you've got to align it with your marketplace you've got to know what your marketplace is looking for most definitely avoid behavioral stuff the fact that you can work well in a team as well as on your own really isn't going to impress anybody so what the fact that you can work well under pressure really so what? You know, the fact that you've got apparently excellent communication skills. Well, you know what? According to CVs, every single last person in the entire working world has excellent communication skills. And I'm pretty certain they don't. And you may well do. But you know what? I'm a recruiter. If I'm a recruiter, right? And I read that on a CV, I just think, well, everybody writes that. So, whatever. So what? Um... So just think to yourself, if you write something and your natural instinct is to go, so what? Then don't put it in there. Just because the job description says they're looking for someone with excellent communication skills who can work well under pressure, who can work well in teams and on their own, doesn't mean <coughs> that you need to fill your CV with that stuff. Of course they want people who, who have those qualities. Um, but it, it, it's not really insightful enough, high level enough to impress anybody. And especially when you get to be more senior, you know, as I said earlier, a lot, most of our clients are either qualified professionals or execs. Not all, we do across the board, but the majority of our clients are, are senior professionals and execs and, and <coughs> that stuff just has no place on a CV of someone at that level. Um, <coughs> It's not about fancy words, although, of course, people who engage our services would expect very, very strong wording and copywriting. But it's more about the substance of what you're writing about that's key. Content's king. But, of course, this is where we earn our money. This is what we're good at. We know what skills should be on your CV. We know how to craft those. We know how to write them. We, need to, we know how to write compelling copy. And look, think of it this way. <coughs> Never in the history... And maybe that's an exaggeration because I'm sure somebody did once, but almost never in the history of business has anybody pitched up to a business meeting with a homemade business card, ever. Because you know what, it looks pretty naff, doesn't it? You know, here's, here's my business card, I made it myself. You know what, that, that, that salesperson or business owner he isn't going to generate an awful lot of business if, if, if that's their approach. You know, it just looks slapdash. It looks unprofessional. 
um, you know what? If if you if you're involved in a business that that manages to generate customers from leaflets and brochures and you know printed marketing collateral, I'm pretty certain that you don't get some intern to knock them up on Microsoft Word and print them off on the office, you know, the office inkjet or laser jet, whatever it is. Y you know, you, you wouldn't. You'd, you'd have them professionally created and professionally printed. Um, <clears throat> even if we think about weddings, you know, people don't get their mate Bob to take all the wedding photographs, do they? you get a professional wedding photographer in. So in all these scenarios, people use professionals. They have things done properly, professionally. So why, why would anybody ever write their own CV? Now, of course, I'm biased. And I have a vested interest in encouraging people to look beyond that. But if you really just think about it, ignore the fact that I've said it and just analyze it in your own mind. You're a senior professional, or maybe you're an exec, and you're flapping around in the job market with a homemade CV that you knocked up on a Sunday afternoon over a few shandies, when you could have invested and had it done properly by people who are experts in it. And it wouldn't cost you an arm and a leg, but it would increase your success rate massively. Why wouldn't you do that? So again, I'm just sowing that seed. Okay, next section on the CV, key skills or expertise. I think key skills is a more obvious heading, but this is just a little section. So you've got that paragraph at the top, then you've got key skills that sits underneath it. Um, <clears throat> and in that key skills section, you want some key words. Okay, and the reason I've got this reference to Arnie I don't know whether you remember the Terminator films, but in the Terminator films, the machines had, or the machines were trying to take over the world. I believe Arnie was a machine, a robot. He'd been sent back in time to, to, to nobble some poor young chap who, uh, who in years to, to pass, fought the machines and won. So they'd sent him back in time to try and, try and. Uh, solve the problem for them but the machines were trying to take over the world now that's not quite happened yet but certainly in although Stephen Hawking bless his heart before he passed away did tell us the biggest threat to uh, to the human race is artificial intelligence um, but uh, anyway we're not quite there yet but machines play an important role in the recruitment industry applicant tracking systems recruitment software and unless your CV is optimized to get past the machines then your CV will never get read by a human. So it's important you know how to do that. So you need to SEO, search engine optimize your CV using keywords. So you're simply gonna have a menu of skills a bit like that. And you'd, you'd have two columns, a column on the left, a column on the right. And maybe you've got between 14 and 16 bullet points in total. <coughs> And that makes sure that the CV is keyword rich. So if people are searching for somebody with post acquisition implementation skills, this person's gonna come up. Yeah, so um, that's that section. Next section on the CV we call career highlights. So just keep a track of this. You've got your profile summary at the top, then your key skills, and then we have a little section called career highlights. And in this section, we have three little mini case studies, okay? Um, now, think about the power of stories. <clears throat> um, I was talking to someone the other day, in fact, I wrote an article about Aesop's fables. Um, do you remember the boy who cried wolf? That was an Aesop's fable. Uh, Aesop was very good at, at, at wrapping up a message in a story. You know, so if I wanted to, um, explain to my son that uh, <coughs> telling fibs and exaggerating is a bad idea instead of just saying hey son don't tell fibs yeah whatever dad I'd tell I'd read him the the Aesop's 
fable, The Boy Who Cried Wolf. Now, I don't know if that would do him some psychological damage, thinking that every time he tells a fib, he's going to get eaten by a wolf. But, you know, um, I, I'm sure that the, the, the message wrapped up in that story has more context and more meaning. So we apply that same theory on CVs. If you've got a story to tell, a project you've led, an achievement, something of note, and we write them as case studies. Um, now, there is a caveat that comes with this. You need to be a good writer. Um, these are not easy to conjure up, but if you master them, they're very powerful. So we write them in star. So these must be no more than six lines long. It's a six line paragraph that you have three sat on page one. <coughs> and um, we use a little formula called star, which is an acronym for situation, task, actions, and result. If you read that little case study there, that's written in star. So we start by naming the company. That's Enterprise Rent-A-Car. This was something I did about 20 years ago uh, when I was a senior manager for Enterprise Rent-A-Car. Uh, so they acquired an unprofitable competitor that was in financial distress and required transformation. That's the situation. What was my task? Well, I was appointed as sales and ops manager to rebrand the business, embed the enterprise business model, and drive profit. So my actions were all these things. I reviewed the business, exited underperforming staff, recruited some different people, trained them, oversaw an office refurb, changed their commercial model, and did some business development stuff. And the result was that I succeeded in rebranding the business and turning a 10K per month loss into break even within six months. It's really simple and straightforward. It's a lovely way of writing a, an achievement to give it enough context that you can then plonk that on page one outside of the career history, but still give it enough context for people to know when you did it. Well, actually, they might not know when you did it. That's probably the bit that is missing, but how you did it, why you did it, who you did it for, all them context building things. So these are really powerful. So I have three of these on page one. Um, my recommendation would be to have a whole heap of these and then you lift the three biggest and best and most relevant into the CV each and every time. So imagine having 10, 15 of these and each time you apply for a job, you pick the three that really relate to that company's challenges and all of a sudden your CV is perfectly targeted them key skills we talked about earlier, you would make sure they match up with a JD, with a job description. And like we said earlier, sometimes people have the, the profile summary we talked about earlier. If, if you have maybe two strings to your bow, maybe you're in the IT sector, maybe sometimes you're a business analyst and sometimes you're a project manager, where well, you'd have two of those opening paragraphs, the profile summary, and you slot the one in that's most relevant each time you apply for a role change the, the key skills to match the job description, slot your three best case studies in, and there you go, page one looks perfect for that role each and every time. So word of caution, <laughs> if your examples are weak, it just highlights failure. They've got to be relevant and targeted, they must be quantifiable, so the result needs to link to some kind of KPI that was relevant. But this is what we're good at. This is where we earn our money. You know, a lot of people don't know their value proposition. They don't know the hot skills in the marketplace. They don't know how to write case studies. <coughs> they don't know how to make them hang together. Um, so that's why lots of people use our service. And I say lots, it is lots. You know, over, I think we've written over, I think we're probably coming on for writing maybe seven, eight thousand CVs since we've been around, something like that. That's a lot. Um, but um, anyway, there you go. Let's have a look at the career history. Now, I imagine you all know what the career history section of a CV looks like, but let's go through it. You, you've got to try and start it on page one. So right at the bottom of page one, your most recent job should start. It doesn't have to end. It can straddle onto page two, but it should start on page one. 
got this drawing, this, this picture here of architects drawings because it's all about the information architecture. So um, reverse chronological, so the most recent job first, start on page one. So start, this is the order of bullet points, by the way. So start with a description of the employer. <coughs> then have a summary of your role. So kind of like a paragraph or you know, maybe two or three lines that just summarizes the purpose of your role. Then if you manage people, what did your team look like? You know, manage a team of 10 with three direct reports, including a operations manager, project manager, and whatever else. How was your role measured? And that's not necessarily for all professions, but quite often knowing how your role is measured, what your KPIs are or were, is really useful. It helps build context. Then you can list your duties and responsibilities. You must then weave in plenty of achievements with outcomes, not just an achievement isn't doing something, it's the outcome of doing something. And you've got to try and use statistics, you know, pounds, percentages, link it to a KPI. And then maybe you have a reason for leaving at the end. You know, if you were there for a shortish period of time, people want to know why you left after a shortage period of time. Um, so that's the kind of <coughs> structure. What I'd recommend is making sure each bullet point, and this should be bullet pointed, has sufficient detail. So we say that one line is skinny, two lines is great, three lines if you have to, never four. So when I say lines, I'm talking about the length of each bullet point. So nice two line bullet points are perfect. Okay. Quick popcorn break. Uh, I just want to tell you what we do. I've been talking about how people use our service, but you know, of course, we create CVs and LinkedIn profiles that significantly increase people's interview rates and job offers because the process we go through with people really helps them to know themselves and their skills and abilities better. Um, but you get matched up with one of our team. If I look at my board here, you know, I've got. I've got a chap who's a exec uh, career coach. I've got uh, a person who was a, a senior IT program manager. Um, I've got a chap who um, was involved in sort of a, a security EU funding for organisations. I've uh, got somebody who um, was involved in the IT sector as a sort of senior project manager. Got an ex oil and gas engineer, um, former uh, HR director, uh, former HR business partner, um, you know, people from a wide, diverse range of backgrounds covering off most of the professions that we deal with, you know, finance, IT, senior exec. Um, projects and program management, marketing, engineering, really right across the board. Um, so senior people who can add value to the process and they take you through a very detailed two hour fact finding or discovery session if you like and that's done remotely over the phone, Skype, uh, Zoom. Um, and by the way we look after clients all over the world just because we're sat here in the UK doesn't mean that we are just UK centric. We can look after people all over the world. Um, so you have this two hour fact finding session and we talk about your career direction and your value proposition and what you want to go to market as. What are your value added skills? What are your key strengths? What have been your achievements? We write your case studies. We write this. We write it all from scratch. Um, help quantify results of your achievements. Um, and we create your business case, you know? We create you a powerful, high impact, cutting edge CV that is just light years better than what your average person can produce at home on a Sunday afternoon over a couple of shandies. Um, and we'll talk about that a bit more at the end. Um, so 
let's have a look at some of the other sections on the CV. So once you've covered off eight to 10 years of your career in detail, or if you're a contractor, maybe the last five to six years, <coughs> and if you're a perm job seeker, you don't want to talk about your permanent jobs. Um, you, you probably don't want to list much more than four in detail. If you're a contractor, then you probably list more than four in detail because you have to. Um, but you might have to cut down a little bit on, on the volume of duties and responsibilities. But um, then you get to, once you've sort of covered off four jobs or eight to 10 years, you, you've got to start tucking things away in an earlier career section. The reason I've put this little image up is you don't need to go back to the 80s, okay? <laughs> Enough said. So just have a little section where you put the date, the name of the company, and the job title, and maybe in brackets, whether it was permanent or contract. And you just have a list um, in that earlier career section. So that's pretty straightforward. Um, good point here, about 15% of applicants have a professionally written CV. So on average, maybe, five, six, seven people that are applying for that job will have invested in a professionally authored CV. Um, your, your homemade CV, even if you're a better candidate than them, is not going to compete. And, and I say that very deliberately. Even if you're a better candidate than them, your homemade CV will not compete with a professionally authored CV. We could write a CV for an average candidate in your world and put it up against the best person in your world who's got a homemade CV and will, at the very least, level the playing field, probably give that person a better chance. Because it's not how good you are, it's how good you are at selling yourself. <coughs> Remember uh, VHF and Betamax. Um, now, if, <laughs> if you're a millennial, you won't, but I'm 46 now. And um, I remember before, before we had st video streaming, um, uh, uh, before we had DVD, we had, we had videotapes, literally tapes that you stuck into a, uh, a tape machine. <laughs> and um, when these first got invented, you had two, two formats. You had VHF and Betamax. Now, it was always said that Betamax was by far the superior technology, um, but VHF had a better, better marketing and commercial strategy. So it wasn't the product that won the day, it was the marketing strategy that won the day. And it's the same with CVs. You could be the most, you could be the best product, the best candidate, but it's the person with the best CV that's going to get the interview. Okay. Um, then you're going to have your qualifications, so you need to have your education, your professional qualifications, any training courses that you've done. Don't need to talk about the university or school unless you went to, you know, one of the top unis or if you went to a particularly impressive school. <coughs> I didn't. I went to Moulton School and Anglia Ruskin University. Nothing really to write home about there. Um, so I don't need that on my CV. You certainly don't need the dates um, because that just promotes ageism if you're getting to a point where ageism might be affecting you. If you've got quite a hefty education section and lots of professional qualifications or certifications, you might split them out into two sections. Um, there you go. That's some feedback I dropped into this slide couple of bits of feedback. We get, you know, maybe three or four emails every week from clients um, talking about how pleased they are with, with what we've done and the great results they've got. So I just thought I'd drop a couple of bits of feedback into these next two slides. Um, there's some there. Uh, there's some there. Personal details. Um, that, that goes at the end. Someone asked me yesterday, why don't the personal details go at the top of the CV? I'm like, well, why would they? Who cares that you live on 33 Lady Lane in Chichester when they first start reading your CV? 
who cares that you're married with two children when they first start reading your CV? What, what they want to know when they first start reading your CV is what you are and what you can do and what you can offer them. So the personal details really need tucking away at the back end of the CV, apart from probably your telephone number and email, which can go at the top, because that's where recruiters are used to finding them. But all the other stuff, your address, um, if you've got a driving license or not, you know, where you'll work, if your security cleared, if you speak any languages, um, if you need to talk about your eligibility to work in the country that you're applying for a job, all that stuff can get tucked away at the back end of the CV in a personal details section. Some general points. Um, so um, we write in what we call a tight writing style. So <coughs> as a general rule, that means we drop quite a lot of a and the words. Um, it's just a sort of more thrifty, tighter way of writing, you know. So uh, you don't need to say managed a team of 10. You just say managed team of 10. So you drop the ah. Um, it's the best way I can explain it. And then active voice. Um, so you wouldn't say management of a team of 10 because that's sort of something that just happens. Management of it doesn't sort of it's not direct it's not a very direct style of speaking management of us if i'm saying that i managed a team of 10 i would say i managed a tv a team of 10 i wouldn't say management of a team of 10 it just it's more passive so sp write in active voice using active words um and whether it's true third person i don't know but you don't you don't have pronouns in your cv so you, you don't you don't say I did this, so I and my you leave out, but you don't refer to yourself by name. So there's a style of writing where you do neither of those, um, and that's how you should write on your CV. Most people refer to it as, as, as a third person style of writing, but it's not third person where you refer to yourself by name. It's slightly different to that. I, 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 exactly the same as the examples that we've showed you they're all written in in that style pretty much every cv i ever see has some spelling errors in it most you know i get people applying for a job with us as a cv writer and their cv and their linkedin profile will have typos and spelling errors um in them um you know actually nearly all <laughs> it nearly all in fact there was some research the other day I wrote an article for I think it was oh, was it was one of the I think it was Contractor UK but it was uh, I think the research was that is it about 80% of CVs that were researched had a spelling error which is startling and um, so you just got to make sure they're not proofread it spell check it proofread it get someone else to proofread it it's difficult, you know. I'm, I'm sure from time to time we make spelling errors in CV and, and that's our living, you know. But you've just got to make sure that everybody checks it. Um, we, we, <laughs> we say to clients, look, check it, please. Make sure we might have missed something. Um, so easy to do. Auto spell check's the biggest damn thing, you know. Uh, I saw a CV we'd written the other day and it had changed manager to manger. It's just so annoying, you know. It's just it's so easy to do. So everybody's going to check it. But just don't send a CV out live to a job application with spelling errors. And get your formatting consistent. Now, I'm always seeing CVs. Half of it's in Arial, half of it's in Calibri, and then something ends up being, um, you know, in, in justified text rather than left aligned for no apparent reason. And, and then, some, you know, there's a there's a eight point gap between one heading in the text and then all of a sudden in the next section it's a 12 point gap just you got to make sure people look at it and think you've got some attention to detail <coughs> um this, this is a good point i think i kind of the way i describe this is you know, i quite often go at the garden center because quite a nice little cafe there and we like going there as a family and I have a potter around at the plants and stuff but 
on any given weekend I can see people literally with a good two or three hundred quids worth of manure and aggregates and pansies and garden tools in their little trolley and they don't blink an eye because spending that sort of money on your garden it's what people do weekends away it's what people do holidays it's what people do you know oh there's the latest iphone out you know okay yeah, i'll happily spend 40 quid a month for three years to buy that new iphone um and then when it comes to cvs which is infinitely more important than any of those things you know people sort of think oh you know do i really want to spend that sort of money on a cv it's just a skewed way of looking at things because the cv is a lot more important than manure and pansies and garden tools and weekends away and holidays it's the ticket to what you do eight hours a day five days a week 48 weeks of the year until you retire or drop down dead it's just a bloody good thing to spend some money on because when you do you get interviews for better jobs that pay more money and that leads to better financial security and also you know getting the right job what you do for so many hours of every day what you do in that time is important to your happiness so you know, I'm forever trying to just change people's thought process a little bit. Again, I'm biased, I admit that. But even if I didn't do this, I'd still see that as just obvious and common sense, frankly. Okay, so um, there we go. Um, now, recommendations. Social proofing now is important. We talked about weekends away and holidays. When was the last time anybody booked a hotel and didn't check it out on TripAdvisor? You know, most people now when they when they buy stuff, they like to see reviews and they like to check out these review sites. Um, uh, that's what we do. So it, it, it's the same in recruitment. So we recommend that you have recommendations on your CV. So this is like what you have on LinkedIn. You'll have seen them on LinkedIn where people have recommendations on LinkedIn if you don't go look at some have a couple of those at the back end of your CV from somebody credible saying nice things about you. It's social proofing. LinkedIn reckon that you're three times more likely to be contacted about an opportunity if you have good recommendations on your LinkedIn profile. So it stands to reason that they work well on a CV. Now you can forget the, you know, I've known Bob for 10 years, he's honest, reliable and trustworthy and I would have no hesitation in recommending Bob for any job ever with any company in the world. I've seen that so many times. I don't know where it ever came from, but it's horrible. It has to be well thought out. It has to be authentic, well written. Um, but if it is, and it's from someone credible, they're very powerful. <coughs> um, our rate card, by the way, for a, 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 our top end CV and LinkedIn uh, profile writing service is £398 plus fat. It's about a day, uh, I said it's a day's work there. That, that's for my very, very efficient people. Um, in reality, it's probably about a day and a half's work for us. It's quite labor intensive. There's quite a lot of back and forth. Um, you know, just think about how much plumbers, electricians, gardeners and builders charge for a day and a half's work. We're no different, you know. In fact, I had a look the other day, um, Molly made the national cleaning company uh, to do a day spring clean in a property in London they quoted £404 we don't charge any more than your average cleaning company um, LinkedIn now I'm not going to spend much time on this but LinkedIn is is this place of course you, most of you will know LinkedIn is this place where you have a profile and people can network and connect with each other but it's also a database with 560 million people in it. So of course, recruiters now use this as the pond in which they fish for, for candidates, for jobs. <laughs> so it's absolutely the most important place to be. It's crucial. Um, you have to be on LinkedIn. And if you're gonna be on LinkedIn, your LinkedIn profile needs to be just as good as your CV. You know, statistically, 
85% of recruiters and hiring managers that have shortlisted you for a job will then check you out on LinkedIn if they've not found you on LinkedIn in the first place. So your CV and your LinkedIn profile just go hand in hand together. They've got to dovetail, they've got to have synergies. You can't get away from it. So there's no point creating a great CV and then having a, a rubbish LinkedIn profile or vice versa. You've got to take care of both of them, which is why usually our clients buy from us a CV and a LinkedIn profile together. Now I know I've referred to our services quite a lot and I have sown that seed throughout the session, but my aim was to give you the blueprint on how to write a great CV um, that you could actually take away and, and do yourself. And I think I've done that. Um, but I also wanted to um, just sow the seed that maybe, maybe, it's worth considering someone else doing it for you because they can probably do it a lot better. Um, so with that in mind, we have a special offer for you. Um, so our top end CV and LinkedIn writing service, where we have that two hour fact finding session with one of my team, and we write it all from scratch. Um, <coughs> you know what, we, we, there are services out there. Uh, in fact, we've got services on our website um, which cost over a thousand pounds, but this isn't going to cost you a thousand pounds. Um, it's not even going to cost you the rate card we charge for a CV and LinkedIn profile, which is 398 plus fat. For those of you who have watched this workshop, we've reduced it to 289 pounds plus fat. That is an absolutely massive discount. Okay. Um, but that expires at the end of the month. Okay, so if you want to give yourself a huge leg up in the job market, between now and the end of the month, you've got an opportunity to buy arguably the best CV and LinkedIn authoring service, not just in the UK, but anywhere, um, for just 289 plus that. Um, and if you're interested, there is the web page to go to. It's our web address slash up289. Okay. If you go to that web page, there'll be more information. There's some FAQs if you've got some questions. Um, you can email us if you want to, and we'll either email you back or we'll call you. We'll have a chat. Um, me or my team, quite happy to pick up the phone and have a conversation with you um, to talk through. Um, what we can do and what's it, what it entails. Um, maybe you, you'd like a free CV appraisal first. That's fine. If you want a free CV appraisal, just contact us on that email address uh, and attach your CV. And we'll be happy to give you some feedback on your existing CV. Um, and that will inevitably lead to a conversation about perhaps what we can do to make it better for you. So that's that. Um, usually when we run these sessions, um, we get quite a lot of interest and orders coming through. So get your order in early if you want to get rolling early. Okay. However, if you're on the other end of the scale, maybe you're a contractor and you're in a contract at the moment, um, you can order now at this reduced rate and then use the service at a later date. Um, if you happen to order on a Friday afternoon, um, my uh, admin person who processes orders isn't always around on a Friday afternoon. So <laughs> that might not get sorted until Monday morning. Um, but that's it, guys. Um, that, is the, uh, that is the end of the webinar. Uh, I hope that's been useful. If anybody has any questions or if anybody would like to just contact us to have a chat about uh, their CV or the services that we offer, you're quite welcome to contact us. Uh, and we'll be happy to speak. Um, our telephone number, by the way, is 01274 That's a UK number. If you're um, based uh, elsewhere in the world, um, you'll use the UK international dialing code and drop the zero, and it'll be 1274 Um So thanks, guys. Have yourselves a great day, and I'll speak to you soon. Thanks.